when you look up the word diversity, you'll see that it means a bunch of different stuff, different stuff coming together or a range of stuff. And I know what diversity means for me in my life. I live it every day and I know that it's something challenging and can be painful, but it's also something really amazing. So growing up as a kid, I grew up in a town that wasn't very diverse. And so I was faced with people who had ideas or thoughts about how I should act or who I was just because of how I looked. So this made me feel really confused on who I was. I felt like I had to pick being black or being white when I didn't feel like I was just one or the other, when I felt like I was both. My name is Carissa, and I was born here in Canada, and Canada is my home, and I love this place. So I'm biracial, which means that I have parents from two different races. My mom is from Germany, and my dad is from Jamaica. And they're people who I love so much. These two cultures are so special because on my German side, my Omi, I would always look forward to her making goulash or food that came from Germany, um, like schnitzel, that she loved to make, and she would bring this into our family and stuff that I could enjoy. And then on my Jamaican side, we'd always have oxtail or roti and rice and peas, stuff that I could only get when I was there with my family. So we're quite a diverse family. My dad is from Jamaica, my mom is from Germany. My brother, he learned to speak Mandarin and went to go live in China for a few years, living in Beijing and Shanghai. My sister went ahead and learned Japanese, and she lived in Japan, um, living in Tokyo and Sapporo. And my brother recently married his wife, Georgina, who's from India and who also speaks many languages. So when my family is together, one thing we like to do is always eat. We just get together, we eat. We hang out, <laughs> we eat. It's always around the table. We always have to have food with, no matter what we do. Especially be Canadian because it's, I find for me, it's something that I can celebrate all these different parts of who I am. It's, being Canadian isn't something that puts a wall up, it, I find it's something that tears walls down and I can celebrate all these different parts of who I am and when I'm in Canada, all the different places I can go, my, my culture, my background isn't hidden in margins but it's, it's right at the front for other people to enjoy as well. We need some Chinese. <laughs> you have a yearning for perfection. Nice. Ah. That one you want to see is just around the corner. Hey, that's oh. Christmas. You'll be especially creative this week. Oh. Oh. That's, that makes a lot of sense. A group of people is missing you. Oh. So I went on a mission trip to Zambia. And while I was there, I had this moment when I realized that God is actually everywhere. That he's not just black or white or even just Canadian. He is in every single nation. And I was in this place that was so different, so different from my understanding. And yet there God was on the other side of the world. And he is still active and he's still loving people. From my parents, I learned about Jesus and saw how much they loved him. And that the color of our skin is not everything. And it's not what's most important. And we have Christ, and we identify with Him. Everything else comes second. Where we're from and our skin color is only second to the love that we have with Jesus and our connection. Danke für die Einladung. Bulani kine tanyabani. Shishye, mei mei. Omane kite daite. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thanks, man. When my family and I get together, and we all come together at one table and we sit down, it makes me think about what Jesus did, that he invited everyone to his table. No matter their background or where they came from or who they were, there's always a spot at Jesus' table. Hello, family and friends. My name is Dewan, and I am so excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much for accepting God's invitation for us to come together to worship Him today. I am always so humbled by the thought of how big and how wide God's kingdom is. You know, sometimes we're tempted to think that God only works in that little bubble, in our little bubble. But then we remember, and then we remember that God is at work across nations all over the world, and how amazing it is that we can connect and come together to show His glory and to share the love of Jesus. So last week we told you that today was going to be the last day that you can make a contribution towards our World Vision project, but we've extended it 
You have till Friday, December 9th to give a gift towards that project. Thank you so much for your generous contributions so far. And talking about gifts, if in any way this ministry, our community has been a blessing to you in any way and you'd like to make a one-time or ongoing gift, please feel free to join um, to connect with or to go to themeetinghouse.com slash give in order to make that contribution. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Okay, so today is the first day in our Christmas series. Jimmy will be leading us. He'll be talking about the gift and what it isn't. But before we go to Jimmy and before we go to Rachel for musical worship, I want us to just recognize that to, th today, this week, we are in the second week of Advent. So you see in this container here, we've already lit our candle for hope. This week, we're focusing on love. Now, do you have your phone next to you? I know you do. Most of you do, right? So what I want to encourage you to do is pick up your phone, and I want you to go to beinchrist.ca slash advent. And there you're going to find a digital devotional, a devotional that's going to help us to center on Christ during the Advent season. How many of you know that Advent is not about celebrating Christmas? It's not. Advent is not about celebrating Christmas, but about expecting it. It's a time for us to prepare our hearts in, ante in anticipation of Christ's return, his second coming, and for us to reflect on the significance of his birth in light of this future hope. Advent helps us to reconnect with the feeling behind our need for a savior who has done for us what we could have never done for ourselves. Did you go to the site? Did you download the calendar or download the devotional? So here's the devotional. It's called Oh Little Town. And what I love about this devotional is it starts off, it talks about the Advent wreath, which we have here, a version that we have here, what it means, the significance, the candles. And obviously it gives a devotion for each day leading up to Christmas Eve. But then it also has a missional piece. So there's a page that gives us activities that we can do to help serve our community over Advent. Okay, so if you have your digital copy, if you go to page 27, there's a candle lighting liturgy. Can you join me while we do this? Are you there? So it's page 27. We come together amid a busy season to take a breath, to breathe in together the life that God gives us, to listen to the beat of God's heart and the blessings and lessons this season brings to us. Each week of Advent, we light this Advent wreath. With its light comes our prayers and our stories. The candle of this second week of Advent is a candle of love. Today, the flame of this candle reminds us of the love that came to this world when Jesus was born and his presence with us. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. So I'm going to light the candle. Actually, you know what? I'm going to take this one. We're going to light the love candle. There we go. Let's pause for a moment to consider the love that Jesus has given us. When have you shared the gift of love? When have you known God's love come into your life or life around you, in the big things or the small? Let's read the prayer together. We thank you, Jesus, that you want to bring love and relationship into every life. We thank you for the love you have brought to us. We bring to you now prayers of love for the people and places on our hearts this morning trusting in your powerful name. Amen. Good morning and welcome. We're so happy that you're here. We are ready to worship, so feel free to stand with us as we praise God. We were just praying backstage as a team um, about being expectant about expecting that God's already here, that he's moving, and that he has something for each of us today. 
And so we can worship him being grateful, knowing that we can expect him to be moving and meet us where we are.
shout of praise. This is Jen and her family. They're going to do Advent for us this morning. In this second week of Advent, we come together amid a busy season to take a breath, to breathe in together the life that God gives us, to listen to the beat of God's heart and the blessings and lessons this season brings to us. Each week of Advent, we light this Advent wreath. With his light comes our prayers and our stories. This candle, the second week of Advent, is the candle of love. Today, the flame of this candle reminds us of the love that came to this world when Jesus was born and his presence with us. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. When have you shared in the gift of love? When have you known God's love? Come into your life and life around you in the big things or the small. Let's pause for a moment to consider the love that Jesus has given us. We thank you, Jesus, that you want to bring love and relationship into every life. We thank you for the love you have brought to us. We bring you now prayers of love for the people and places on our hearts this morning, trusting in your powerful name. Amen. Thank you, guys. And with that, we're gonna sing about joy.
sing out and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of God never gives someone a gift they are not capable of receiving. If he gives us the gift of Christmas, it is because we all have the ability to understand and receive it. Pope Francis The way you spend Christmas is far more important than how much. Henry David Thoreau Blessed is the season which engages the whole world in a conspiracy of love. Hamilton Wright Mabby. Jesus displaced himself that we might know him. This is incarnational ministry, and it is the life we're called to. Aaliyah Joy. God is so great that he can become small. God is so powerful that he can make himself vulnerable and come to us as a defenseless child so that we can love him. Pope Benedict XVI For outlandish creatures like us, on our way to a heart, a brain, and courage, Bethlehem is not the end of our journey, but only the beginning. Not home, but the place through which we must pass if ever we are to reach home at last. Frederick Buckner I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. Scrooge And the word, Christ, became flesh, human, incarnate, and tabernacled, fixed his tent of flesh, lived a while among us, and we, actually, saw his glory, his honor, his majesty, such glory as an only begotten Son receives from his Father, full of grace, favor, loving kindness, and truth. 
John, chapter 1, verse 14. Well, it was the early 90s. I was just a kid growing up in Kingston, Ontario, and it was the first time my grandma, my nanny, flew from the east coast of Canada to spend a Christmas season, like a couple weeks with us, culminating in Christmas morning. Now, for lots of us, that's like a regular thing. All of your extended family gets together, but we were like, uh, you know, quite divided by geography as a family. And so for my nanny, my grandma, to come and spend a couple weeks is like the, the, the most pivotal, pivotal memory that I have as a kid, her being there. Now, as grandmas are, if you're a grandma, shout out to you, she was like so gentle, so kind, quiet, but so intentional with how she spent time and her energy with us. She was the kind of grandma that like just had chocolates out, (laughs) just like unbridled for kids and all to see and eat. Now, there's one time in particular this Christmas um, that I'm referring to, I wanted a GT snow racer, yes. Amen. Let's pray at the end of the sermon. (laughs) Now, in particular, let's see if you get this one. I wanted the Wayne Gretzky white fairing GT snow racer. Oh, (laughs) they don't make them anymore. So this thing was huge. It came in a huge box. It was like not the the typical like skeletal GT snow racer with just like the the round handle. It had square handles, pegs, and an an ignition switch on it. There's no engine in it, it's just gravity. Lots of plastic, white with the number 99 in front of it so that I could remind all of my peers I am faster and better than you on this hill. Regardless, that's what I asked Santa for for that Christmas. And sure enough, Christmas morning comes and I see this giant box in front of our tree. And I'm like, oh snap, I got the GT snow racer. And so I tear this thing open and sure enough, I'm like, ah, it's happened, Jesus alive. (laughs) And so I unwrap this thing and I'm like, I got what I wanted. I got what I deserved. And then my nanny, sweet intentional, thoughtful, quiet nanny just goes like this, look in the branches of the tree. So I go over to the tree and I find this little like tiny little gift wrapped up and it's a CD and I unwrap the CD and guess what it is? It's Rap Tracks 5. (laughs) Rap Tracks 5, this little beauty right here. (laughs) Amazing, look at that artistry. Rap Tracks 5. Now, my nanny also remembered that I was super into rap and hip hop, and I grew up in a family where the only music to don uh, our home was like, sorry, mom and dad, if you're watching this, like Michael W. Smith, Sandy Patty, and if we were lucky, Petra. And if you don't know who those people are, you are doing real good, real good. (laughs) And so for Rap Tracks to make it into my sweet little like grade seven, grade eight hands. I was like, oh my gosh, the gift is mine. I left my GT Snow Racer behind and ran upstairs and just like played this thing over and over and over again. And since then, the thoughtfulness of my nanny, the thoughtfulness, the intention, like my nanny wasn't going around like listening to hip hop and like doing rap battles in like urban centers. You know, she was 70, 80 years old and she was just like, my grandson loves this. I don't really know what I'm looking at, but I think he would like this. And despite like, you know, what kids are normally drawn to, like the big um, uh, audacious gifts, I really think he'll like this. And she hid it in the tree. It was a moment between her and I. And since then, it's been one of those like ping memories to remind me that it's not about this. It's rarely ever about in this season about this. And this series, I hope, will be a reminder to kind of like unplug us from the, the, the wall, the boxes, the accumulation of stuff and, and like getting all of the right things around the tree and framing our hearts and minds around the right things around Jesus. That in this Christmas season, in Jesus, we're reminded that hope has entered the world through love, joy, and peace. And brothers and sisters, he intends to stay That hope in Jesus has entered the world through love and joy and peace, and he intends to stay with you, with me, with us, with our church, with the world. The story does not end after this season wraps up. So welcome to our series called The Gift. Did you get it? (laughs) 
We're talking about what it isn't today. Next week, what it is, and then week three, uh, what it should be, and then culminating in our Christmas Eve experience across all of our sites and locations. So we are so thankful that you are here today, whether you're uh, here in person in Oakville or tuning in uh, online. We're so hopeful that this is going to be an impactful reminder of, of the story that we've been telling and rehearsing for, for centuries, that Jesus is here. Now, to get us in the Christmas spirit, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to stand. Yep, right now, stand. And I recognize that like to our degree of comfort, in whatever way you feel comfortable, turn to somebody beside you and in your loudest, like most outdoor voice, wish them a Merry Christmas. Now you can do that through a fist bump, you can do it through a handshake, but turn to somebody that you did not come with and in your loudest voice, wish them a Merry Christmas. Go. Merry Christmas. All right, all right, that's enough Christmas spirit, enough. (laughs) Very good. Wasn't that fun? Yeah. Think about the impact, the significance of what we all just did. Merry Christmas. Now, um, nerd out with me here for a while. Uh, Linguists and etymologists trace this phrase back to the 1500s in like uh, England, that typically like a royal greeting around this time to celebrate Jesus was happy Christmas. Happy Christmas to you, happy Christmas to you. But then it was like stolen, some would say, by like the common folks, the working class, that like, well, happiness is, is a condition of your mind and your heart, like it's based on like the external conditions, whereas Mary, and there's no real good definition of what this word means or the root of where it came from, except that it's, a, it's an action word. Mary means to go and to make, to create, that it's not based on the conditions in, it's based on the work that you do outside. So think about the beauty of that phrase, Mary, go and make Christ, Messiah, Lord Jesus, mass, his celebration. Go and make the celebration of Jesus. Go and make, create the celebration of Jesus. Remind yourselves that this season moves us towards action. Mary, make Christ, Messiah, Jesus, mass celebration. So what is it that we are celebrating? Something big and beautiful wrapped with a bow? Or is it something small and um, minimalist and unassuming? The answer is yes. All of those things. Now, turn in your Bible, if you have one, or if you've got it on your phone, uh, across all of our sites, too. We're going to go through all of the Gospels this morning. Aren't you glad you came to church? Every single one of them. But we're going to land on the book of Luke and the book of John, in particular Luke chapter 2 and John chapter 1. So if you want to put your thumb in that section of the Bible, Luke chapter 2 and John chapter 1, we're going to be looking at the enormity the enormity of like how the gospel writers come at this story. Now, if you remember from a few series ago, and even our last series, we talked through like how did did the Bible, how did the New Testament come together? So even in the birth narrative of Jesus, as people telling like how did this all get its start, we have four different authors at different time periods who are looking in on the same story and coming at it from different perspectives. Some focus on the bigness, the grandeur of the moment of Christ's birth. Some focus on the small uh, external details that contribute to make this merry moment. And some focus on the cosmological uh, response of the world that in inception, this was in the mind of God, the birth, the enfleshment of God was in the mind of God from the beginning. So Matthew's gospel, it's really, really interesting. Um, The big and the small. In Matthew's gospel, we start with uh, the baby. So we read that Mary and Joseph are pledged to be married to each other. Now think about that for a second. Have you ever heard that terminology before, that they're betrothed or pledged? In our context, we think, oh, this nice couple went out on a date and had a latte, and then he proposed, and now they're just waiting until they get to marriage. Not so in Jewish culture. This was a multi-year evolution of a relationship that was set up by parents. And so when you read Mary and Joseph in Matthew's Gospel, You are reading about teenage kids who are betrothed, committed, covenanted to each other. Typically, the male uh, family is like purchasing or adopting uh, the female into the family. And so Mary is, some would say, like forcibly or nudged committed to Joseph's family. Interesting. 
a multi-year process where eventually Mary and Joseph would be married and Mary would be invited into the family home, the family trade, the family practice, and there would be another room built onto their family home. Mary would live into the family that she had been betrothed to. But then we have this massive interruption. Mary becomes pregnant. The Holy Spirit has formed this child within her. Mary and Joseph have not had sex yet. They have not been married. They are not living together, but something has happened here. It is, the, it is the, the most disgraceful thing that can happen in the betrothal period for a woman, for a young woman, for a teenager to become pregnant with somebody that is not the commitment of her family and not the commitment, the consummation with her husband. And then even worse, think about this awkward conversation at the dinner table. It's the Holy Spirit who did the work of forming this child within her. Joseph, the teenager, knows the disgrace that this will bring his family and him. And notice that he does not annul. He does not just step away. He decides in his heart to divorce her quietly and to send her away quietly to protect everybody from the disgrace of this moment. And then what happens? He has an encounter with the angel of the Lord in a dream. And what does the angel of the Lord say to him? Oh, you disobedient son. Why could you not trust your soon-to-be wife? Instead, in the gentleness of Jesus, in the gentleness and kindness of God, the very first thing that the angel of the Lord says is what? Do you remember? Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of what's to come. And he gives the baby a name in a dream, Yehoshua or Yeshua, Jesus, for God will save, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 7 moves into the disgrace through experience and a new message, a new way that God is upsetting, is subverting the systems of power, the economy of power, the burden sometimes of family that nothing good can come of this. Maybe you've felt like that before. And instead, the angel, the presence, the message of the Lord says, do not be afraid. Mary has the baby, they name him Jesus, the word gets out that the Messiah has born, and then everything goes absolutely bonkers. Now, fast forward to the book of Mark. Mark's gospel is amazing. Here's what he says about the birth of Jesus. Uh, Nothing. Nothing at all. It's just birth from earth. We don't care. Let's get to adult Messiah Jesus and how he takes over the entire world and saves and cares for poor and sick people. Mark's gospel just wants to get straight to the point that this is the Son of Man, Son of God, and he'll change the world. And then we get to Luke and John. Luke chapter 2, here's what they both say. At that time... The Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, remember that name, the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and all returned to their ancestral homes or towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem and Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. And that night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared around them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the expected one, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. (laughs) In the beginning was the word already. He already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot, can never, will not, will never extinguish it. Micro, macro, small gift, Big gift, little details, big details here on earth among shepherds in an unassuming place, up in the cosmos at the inception of all creation, God is telling the same story. Do not be afraid. Joy has arrived in Jesus. Hope has arrived through love, joy, and peace, and it plans to stay, brothers and sisters. 
Now, in Luke's gospel, did you notice what, uh, the first name that's mentioned in Luke chapter 2? What's the first name that's mentioned? Caesar Augustus. Amazing. Who was Caesar Augustus? Outside of the Bible, extra-biblical historical research will show you that Caesar Augustus was the divine son, the savior of the world, the Galion, the message of the gospel that comes to the world, redeeming it and saving it through Rome. And this tricksy little hobbit, Luke, adds that at the beginning detail of his gospel, saying, well, in that time when Caesar Augustus, the divine king, the Lord, the savior of the world, came into the world, he took a census. Well, what is a census? It's a way of knowing who is what, who is where, and how to tax them. And so I feel like this is a dig of looping, like, ta-da, the savior of the world is in, in the building, but he doesn't know where people are, doesn't know where they live, and doesn't know how much they'll owe, but he wants their money. Luke adds that detail for a reason, subverting empire, subverting the powers that be that, that in, in their understanding, the wider understanding of God coming to earth, it was to rule and to exert power, not to love and like share joy. Fascinating, fascinating. Starts with this uh, census from Caesar, the divine one, the son of God, ruler, savior of the world. Mary and Joseph have to leave, leave Nazareth to Bethlehem, to Galilee, to Bethlehem to register, and while they're there, she gives birth in an unassuming way in a home. Uh, likely could have been um, family friends, could have just been an extension of family, could have just been an extension of like Eastern hospitality, that of course a young pregnant woman um, traveling w- will put you up, but there just is no room because everybody is going everywhere, so you can stay on the ground floor, which typically in a Jewish home, the upper floor was like the meal sharing and the bedrooms, as it were, it's where the, it's where the humans lived, and the ground, the second floor, and then the ground floor was like where the animals were, because, you know, there were predators uh, out, and so you wanted to protect your your animals, your, your animals were your livelihood. So think about the, the, the image that God gives here, that there's no room upstairs with the humans, but that the Savior will come into the world as lowly as the animals are in a home, guest at someone else's house, a guest in the world. Brilliant. Then, nearby, common shepherd folks are living out in the fields, making sure no one steals their sheep. Later, Jesus will call himself the great shepherd. Amazing, amazing. An angel of God appears to the shepherds, appears to the shepherds, and what's the first thing that he says to them? Don't be afraid. This is really good news. Don't be afraid. This is really good news that will make and create joy in everyone that hears it, the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one, the real king, creator of the world has come. The incarnation of of God is here and now everything will change. That hope has arrived and joy will follow close behind. Isn't that amazing? Now flipping over to John's gospel, we pick up from John's announcement that this was actually in the mind of God from the beginning, from the inception of the cosmos. This was the plan of God. John John doesn't mention uh, the baby's birth. He doesn't mention Mary, Joseph, shepherds, uh, wise men, angels, um, you know, giant Christmas boxes, nothing. All he mentions is Emmanuel, God with us. John widens out and starts with the enormity of the logos, a term that actually wasn't a Jewish term. It was a, it was a Greekified term that meant like the, the intelligence, the mantra, the mission, the way of the divine, the way the divine orients its action. And John puts a name and a personality to it. It says, you know about the word, the message of God, and the logos, the presence, the intelligence of God, it all culminates in inception, in the created moment that Jesus was there, that Jesus is the genesis of all creation, where it all began. Jesus was there, and now Jesus is here. Jesus was there at, at inception, and now Jesus is here in creation. And the lights have been turned on, and now everything changes. Now God is with us, making his presence no known to us through love and joy and peace, and God plans to stay, to make his tent, his tabernacle, his dwelling here with us, with the lowest of the low, with humble beginnings, the creator of the cosmos, shrunk down into unassuming human flesh with parents that could have been moved towards disgrace, and now everything changes. If you've ever felt dejected or out or on the wrong side of creation, the message of Jesus is like, I got you. I know. But this is really good news. Everything changes from here. 
brothers and sisters, the gift given to us in Jesus today and the reminder through the series and season uh, is, is like that Rap Tracks 5. It's, um, it's bigger than you think and it's smaller than you think. The gift given, given to us is small enough to make its dwelling, its presence, its life, its home in and through us, but big enough to change our entire lives our entire perspective on what it means to be human, to reshape absolutely everything in the world through love and joy and peace, and it's ours to make merry. It's ours to celebrate in Jesus. It's ours to celebrate and engage with and create with as the body, the extension, the hands and feet of Jesus, which is the church. So as we start the series, but as we move towards a close this morning, I want us to ask ourselves, well, what is it with us? Like, what is it with us? What is this gift to us? As a church, it should be no surprise that we want to model the simple message of the birth and life of Jesus and then the enormity of God's desire to change everything, to change the world in and through us, literally to make Mary to continue the celebration of Jesus. But what is it? to us. What's our, what's your, what's my experience today and maybe how we've drifted a little bit. Maybe uh, in this season you've experienced a little bit of drift, confusion, fog in your focus. Your eyes and desires have been on the accumulation of like more, just more stuff, more things around the Christmas tree more gifts that we're stressed out about giving the right thing to the right people, gathering the right stuff around the right people in order that the right people might feel happy with us. And what happens? Jesus' gift shows us, nope, that's not it. Maybe in this season you know your own propensity to run yourself ragged with gatherings and meetings and family functions and coffees and lattes and turkey dinners that you've really never liked turkey from the beginning, but you're making it for your family anyway, and all of the things get checked off on your list only to find that on December 25th, you're exhausted, sick, unwell, and lonely. And Jesus' message to us is, nope, that's not it. Or maybe in this season, you're reminded of the difficulty of just what it means to be human, to walk through suffering. You've experienced loss and pain, and you might feel, even this morning, that you're just staring into the darkness, feeling that there's no hope in sight. And to that, I think that Jesus reminds us that hope has entered the world through love, joy, and peace, and plans to stay with you, with me, with us, even in and through pain. Jesus has not gone anywhere. As we wrap up, I want to invite us to close our eyes. And as we close, I'm going to give us just a few minutes to reflect, to think, to process where this gift is in our experience, in our hearts, our minds, our everyday walking around life. And as we close, we're going to give ourselves some time to actually like action and answer these three questions. So with your eyes closed, question number one. What are some things Jesus might be inviting you to stop or slow down in this season? Question number one, what are some things Jesus might be inviting you to stop or slow down in this season? Question number two, What are some things Jesus might be inviting you to start, to lean into, and to reimagine in this season? Number two, what are some things that Jesus might be inviting you to start, to lean into, and to reimagine in this season? And question number three, who as someone Jesus might be nudging you to invite to a meal, a drink, a coffee, a gift to celebrate, to make merry with in this season? Who is someone Jesus might be nudging you to invite in for a meal, a drink, a coffee, or a gift to celebrate, to make merry with in this season?
brothers and sisters, as we move through this season as a church, may we, we be reminded that this gift, the incarnation, the hereness, the birth, the presence, the lived presence of Jesus, that in that hope has entered the world through love, joy, and peace, and plans to stay with you, with me, with us. In Jesus' name, and together we all said, amen. What are some things that we need to slow down? What are some things that we need to lean into? Who are some people that we need to connect with? These are questions that we can connect with our online churches, our online home churches, just to go through further this week. So I want to encourage you to connect with your online community just to further um, explore those questions um, and really reflect on them for yourself this week. Thank you, Jimmy, for starting us off in such an amazing way. All right, so I have a great announcement for you. So you can plan out your life this season, Christmas Eve. Please keep a space on your calendar for Christmas Eve, 4.30. We're gonna do an online gathering. At 4.30 on Christmas Eve, we want you to be here so that we can have some worship, we can have some word, we can have some fellowship together online. So we are gonna be doing that, so yes. Pencil that onto your calendar so that you can be here with us so that we can be together. Another thing that we're um, encouraging is that we would like to invite our little ones to send in a video wishing the community Merry Christmas. Here's an example of videos that we did for last year. For today in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born for you. He is the Lord Yahweh. Yahweh. He is the Lord Yaha. Yahweh, the Messiah. The Messiah. 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 Aren't they so cute? Okay, so if you are interested in sending in a video, please go to liveatthemeetinghouse.com. You'll get all the instructions there. Um, or email. Sorry, as you can tell, I am not technologically savvy. I am not about any of this. Okay, so you're going to email, you're going to email live at themeetinghouse.com to ask for further information on how to do the videos. It's a five to se 10 second video with our little ones just wishing a Merry Christmas. And we're going to incorporate that into our Christmas Eve service. Okay. Um, what else? I think that's it for today, my friends. So what I would like to do is I'd like to leave you with some words from the Bible. We're gonna look at Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. And it says, May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Go in peace.